Let's talk about slide technique. And the first thing I'd like you to try is without the instrument, I want you to take your left hand and find your right collarbone. And you can do this along with me and watch me to help. And we're going to trace it all the way to where it ends. Mine's right here. There's a joint there, it's called sternoclavicular, or SC for short. What you can do is put your index finger on this one, and then put your thumb on the other side, just so you can feel the difference. And then I want you to take your right arm and swim, very big full range circles. The point behind doing this is that you should feel lots of motion at the joint, at this SC joint. So with your thumb, you can compare and tell that there's no motion on the left side. And on the right side, you should feel a generous amount of motion in that joint. You can change directions if you'd like. Now I'd like you to transition from this swimming motion to trombone playing. And imagine that you're moving the slide. And move all the way out and all the way in. <clears throat> you should still feel motion in the joint. For me, when I get to about fourth position, that's when this joint kicks in, and then it continues to move to help me get all the way out to seventh position. So if you don't know about this joint, you are at a disadvantage. Here's what a trombone player might look like without knowing about the joint. And then when they learn about the joint, they look like this. You can see they have a much bigger range of motion here. To move the slide, trace a straight line with your right hand fingers. To move the slide, trace a straight line. That's all there is to it. In order to do this, you will use all of the jointed areas of your arm. Let's count them together. So you have, of course, fingers. That's one jointed area. Wrist, that's two. Elbow, that's three. Upper arm joint, that would be four. Go ahead and move that. Now you just learned number five. It's right here. So if you move from there, that's your SC joint. Five jointed areas. Use them all. Use them all. Don't limit yourself by thinking, I have to move with the wrist. While there is, of course, wrist motion involved, if you limit yourself like that, it will compromise your slide technique. So that's why I say trace a straight line. If you just think that, and only that, and you're aware of the five jointed areas, then you will use all of your tools, all of your jointed areas, in varying proportions up and down the slide. Now again, that might seem complicated, but you don't have to think like that. All you have to think is trace a straight line. I'll show you how to do this. Keep your slide locked and put your horn right up to your face so it really feels natural. And you're gonna put your lips right on the metal, keep the slide locked and take that right hand and just use your fingertips to trace along the tube, the bottom tube. Watch me do it. So I'm essentially just tracing a straight line with my fingers. When you do this, have a minimum of bell motion. Because if the bell is moving, then clearly you're not really tracing a straight line. So try it again and watch the bell. A lot of people will have an arc in the middle and the bell will go up and down and that's going to disrupt your embouchure and, and your slide technique. So trace that straight line. So as I said, up here in the higher positions, I'm using an awful lot of elbow. And as I move out, I start to use the other joints in combination with the elbow. So the SC joint will kick in right about here. I'm using a little bit of finger and a little bit of wrist. And then to get all the way out to seven, I'm going to extend those fingers. All right? So the point is, you have five jointed areas, use all of them. Trace a straight line. And when I do that and actually move the slide, what it feels like is that I'm just guiding the slide on its track. It's very gentle and efficient. It doesn't feel like I'm fighting it, like I'm not trying to change the track of the slide. 
I'm just cooperating with it. So it's me modifying my mechanics to accommodate the straightness of the tube. After all, the tube is metal. So if you think about it, it makes sense to use all of your tools to accommodate the straightness of the slide. And even as you're moving and you're playing, try to minimize bell motion so that you don't disrupt your embouchure. Um, one more thing before we move on. Your shoulder blade in the back is not attached to your ribs. That's very important because if you think it is, then you won't have good slide technique. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to move the slide generously for you. And this time I want you to watch as my shoulder blade rotates around the ribs and then comes back to neutral, back and forth. This is neutral. So when you come back to first, make sure you're genuinely neutral. I have a lot of students who will do this. That's not neutral. That is. So don't harbor tension. Don't keep tension here because you're working hard. You want to let it go. Let it go so that it's very easy to move the slide in and out like that. Okay? All right. Now let's talk about the technique of actually getting the slide in the right place at the right time. A tuner is absolutely necessary to learn this. Slide positions are not equidistant. In other words, to get to second position is a shorter different distance than going from two to three, etc. So the farther out you go, the farther away the next slide position is. The reason for this is that in order to go down by a half step, you have to add 6% of the current overall length. And 6% of that is more than 6% of that. So it's proportional. So don't try to equalize the distance between the slide positions. Then you'd be really out of tune. So again, going back to the idea a tuner is absolutely essential. You need to figure out where every slide position is by how it sounds and how it feels. You cannot just count on how it feels. That's an important part of it, but you have to listen in order to get the slide into the right place. Please, whatever you do, folks, do not touch the bell. You don't need to do that. When you touch the bell to find third or fourth position, you are turning off your ears. You're just counting on how it feels. And turning off your ears is one of the worst things that any musician can do. Touching the bell gives trombone players a bad name, so don't do it. How do you find it? By listening. So as you're moving your slide out, don't default to touching the bell with your fingers because I know you're thinking that will help you, but in the long run, it's just going to hurt you. Some students find it hard to let go of the notion that you're going to stop for every note. It depends on the circumstance. If I'm playing slow music and the notes last a long time, yes, I'm going to stop for every note. So there's clearly a stop. Stop the slide, stop the slide. And um, when you're first learning to play the trombone, all of your music is slow. Because <laughs> you have to learn where the slide positions are. That's logical. But at some point, presumably, you gain enough technique and enough success that you can start to play faster music. And one of the keys to playing faster music on trombone is what I call pick it up as you go by. Pick it up as you go by means you don't stop for every note. I'll give you an example. I'll play just a chromatic scale down and up. I'll start slow, and you will see me stop very clearly for every note. 
But as I accelerate, there's going to come a point where I'm going to, I'm going to stop stopping for every note and I'm going to transition into pick it up as you go by. See if you can tell where that moment is for me. If I were to play the fastest part of that drill and try and stop for every note, it would be a mess. <laughs> uh, so it's really important to understand because it's what holds back a lot of players. And there are many, many moments in trombone literature where I will transition from stopping for every note right into, you know, pick it up as you go by. And the transition happens smoothly. I can't even tell I'm doing it. It's just what the music demands. So that's what you do. Now, when you're first learning this, you will have to think about it a little, but my hope is as you practice it, then it'll start to make sense to you and you'll get the coordination down and you can make the transition just as smooth as I did with my little drill here. So uh, let's take another example of something in the literature that's fast that I would actually uh, pick it up as I go by. Um, well, let's try the David Concertino. It's one of my favorites. So um, there's a moment on the first page of this concerto um, where I would definitely transition into pick it up as you go by. This is the very end. All it is is basically an E flat scale. It goes by really fast. And I have students who try to play this thing and, and stop for every note and they fall behind. This is why. If I were to do that, it, it feels isometric, you know, like I'm trying real hard. And it should just feel like you're just tracing the line of the slide, right? So here it is again, the, I'm, doing, I'm gonna do it right. Now I know exactly where those direction changes are and I'm putting that D out in flat four. So um, if you combine all these attributes, you get the situation where it just wants to come out and it becomes less of a burden and more of a sense that you're making music.